The Supreme Court heard roughly three hours of oral arguments yesterday on whether YouTube should be held responsible for the videos it suggests and promotes through its algorithm. The case concerns the killing of Noemi Gonzalez, an American college student who was studying abroad in Paris in 2015 when she was killed in an attack carried out by ISIS. Plaintiffs in the case argue that YouTube is partially responsible for enabling the attack that killed Gonzalez by recommending ISIS videos and others promoting violent ideology. The question at hand surrounds the legal shield known as Section 230, which protects Internet companies from legal action over content that is published on their platforms. Chief Justice John Roberts and Justices Elena Kagan and Katanji Brown Jackson yesterday called into question whether Section 230 also shields companies when they recommend content, suggesting social media companies may be interpreting the rule too broadly. However, a majority of the justices seemed inclined to side with YouTube's parent company, Google, in the case, with some arguing that if the court sides with the plaintiffs, it would open a floodgate of lawsuits. The court will hear arguments in a similar case regarding Twitter later this morning, with decisions in both cases likely to come in June. Uh, George, I'm curious, uh, saying that a floodgate of lawsuits would open up, why does that matter? I mean, if something is right or wrong, you, you're, are, you, are you making a decision based on, oh boy, this would be messy, oh boy, this would prompt lawsuits, well, of course it would. Yes. I mean, I, I think when judges go about deciding things, they do look at the consequences. But I think the justices were looking first and foremost at the language of the statute. The statute is pretty, at least the one sentence that matters is pretty yeah. broad. I mean, basically it says if you get content from somewhere else, it's not yours. It's someone else's. That's right. And, you know, mm -hmm. the fact that they may, hey, you, they may have to, that they may recommend some things or put some things higher than others, well, that, that's the only way you can function. You, you, the, all websites have to do that or else you'd never be able to find anything or you'd never, you'd, it wouldn't be usable. And I think the justices, um, you know, for all the uh, disclaimers that they they made about not really understanding the internet because they're old yeah. people. Um, they they got that point, uh -huh. and I think that's <clears throat> the point that was made in Google's briefs pr quite well. So, Joe, this might be a job for Congress, but is there an appetite to deal with it? No, this is John Roberts' court. This is the same mm -hmm. John Roberts that said, "Don't ask me to change Obamacare and get rid of Obamacare from the court." Mm -hmm. this year when you can do the same thing in the voting booth next year. And mm -hmm. I think that's what they're going to do with Section 230 as well. Uh, the Roberts Court will say, don't ask us to step in and do Congress's job for them. If you want to amend it, if you want to change it, that's fine. I will say the one part that is fascinating is is this algorithm question. If, if social media companies are pushing people to violent content, that's that does seem to go beyond the scope of what 230 intended and we've seen it time and again we saw it during the black lives matter protests i believe the guy in oakland that uh, saw something online if i'm not mistaken he mm -hmm. went to a hate groom and then went to an oakland courthouse and shot a guard we saw it happening there we saw it on january the 6th where people that were, were going on to certain areas certain chat rooms and then they were pushed uh to whether it was white supremacy sites or whether it was was uh neo-nazi sites uh that seems to be again going well beyond the scope of 230 so it'll be fascinating to see how the court addresses that i, I do want to ask you though uh maura about something that's always bothered me about section 230 and i i guess i i have to admit here that i voted for it like back mm. like in the <laughs> ice age i think it was 1996 because you didn't want like little internet companies that had comments down at the bottom uh, getting in trouble if somebody put a comment at the end of a blog post and wipe that. So it uh, obviously things have exploded though, and you've got these multi-billion-dollar corporations that make money off of hate speech, that make money off of allowing people to spread lies to millions and millions of people. 
uh, and do the sort of things that if the New York Times did it, uh, they would, the Times would be put out of business. The idea that this is 1996 and we're talking about you've got Mel or CompuServe is completely <laughs> asinine. Isn't it time for Congress to start holding Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk and other owners of these, uh, uh, these corporations just to the same standard? that everybody else is held to. Why do we carve things out for? And I would have said Jack Dorsey before, and I did say that a couple of years ago. This is, it's just insanity that we're allowing these billion dollar corporations to, to, to have an exemption that nobody else has. You know, Joe, you're making a powerful case here that the law just, maybe it just is out of date. I mean, listening to you talk about the way you were thinking about it when it was enacted is reason enough. Uh, you're right. The Internet has changed. The world has changed. But this is one of those areas of American exceptionalism, too, where other uh, democracies look at us and say, well, why can't you figure this out? And one of the reasons is we actually have a very broad First Amendment statute. And, of course, as a journalist, that's a wonderful thing. The problem here is that the world has changed. And so, to your point, Joe, now you have companies that are actually not journalistic organizations that are disseminating um, information, some of it factual, some of it dangerous, some of it hate speech, and they are, they essentially have no responsibility uh, for the consequences of that. So we have right. this central tension, um, and, I, you know, it's easy to get wonky. We all know what Section 230 is here at the table, but, you know, for the Americans sitting at home, the question is, well, what responsibility should YouTube or Google or Facebook have if they're promoting hate speech on their platforms? Um, I think the average American would say they should have some, uh, but legally, that's a harder case to make. And I, I don't have an answer for it, but it's just to say that I don't think we can allow it to go on as it has, where there's no consequences and people can make money, in fact, to your point, uh, right. while, while disseminating this information that is tearing the country apart. Mm. And, and by the way, providing uh, disinformation, um, and it, in some cases has made us very, very uh, endangered, like with January 6th. So there's yeah. real consequences to this, and, and I hope the court realizes that. And by the way, I say this is a free market conservative. Cor corporations should be able to do what corporations should want to do, uh, but they have to live by the law. And if, if they are negligent or if they do things that, that, that harm other people, they can be taken into court. They shouldn't be shielded from this. Like, Maura, let me ask you, what if the New York Times uh, just started printing uh, after Paul Pelosi got attacked, that Paul mm. Pelosi got attacked because it was his gay lover or a gay prostitute uh, that he had been, uh, you know, entangled with for years and that it was all a scam and that that uh, the police were in on it and that Nancy Pelosi, uh, all of this garbage that, by the way, a lot of people were putting on Facebook, a lot of people were putting out on social media. Uh, what would happen to the New York Times? I mean, our lawyer would be very busy. Nothing good would happen to the New York Times. Right. I mean, we wouldn't, we wouldn't do that, number one, um, because journalism organizations uh, do hold themselves to a higher standard. But also, we don't have those same legal protections because it is our content, and the law considers it to be our content. And that is the, the difference here, the distinction legally. But I think given the world we live in, it's not entirely clear, and I'm not a lawyer, that that distinction is meaningful when you have the kind of um, large-scale hate speech that you do. And you also have consumers who they don't necessarily know, they're not aware that, oh, this isn't YouTube's content. They're not making those distinctions. So, so right. how is this actually functioning in the real world? Right, and, and, and George Conway, really quickly, something again, very personal to us. I don't bring it up because I'm bothered by it. I bring it up because just to let our viewers know, okay, well, this is what happens to people. Donald Trump called me a murderer 12 right. times. Mm. Yeah. We, we talked to Twitter. We talked to people at Twitter. I'm like, hey, dude, this, this guy, you know, he's lying to me. He's got 60 million followers. And this is being spread around to hundreds of millions of followers. You know it's a lie, and I know it's a lie. You're making money off of the traffic that it's generating. Take it down. No, yeah. we can't take it down. Mm. And so, as Mika knows, I mean, that went on over and over again, 12 times. So yeah. this idea, again, you take that where this, this 
multinational corporation is making billions and billions of dollars. Um, even though I thought it was funny, Elon Musk said he purchased uh, the, the, uh, the, the, what did he say? He said, I spent $44 billion purchasing the biggest nonprofit ever. <laughs> it's kind of a funny line. I almost liked that one. Uh, but they're making <laughs> billions and billions of dollars, like Jack Dorsey was. They let this, this guy lie 12 times because they're afraid to cross him, and they were terrified to cross him. And that is so far away from how what we voted on in 1996, where we didn't want a little blog post uh, about airport traffic, like being sued because somebody put a comment at the bottom. I mean, come on. Congress needs to change this law, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. And, and it has to be Congress. I mean, judges, when judges get into trying to figure out the right policy to fix something that Congress didn't completely fix, um, the, the, the judges get they, they get lost and they don't really have a mandate to do it. And it's Congress's job to do it. Although, you know, I know <laughs> confidence in Congress is, is at all time low. Problems. But there is there is some middle ground here to be had. I mean, you know, this is there's a there's some middle ground between the between um, the CompuServe comments at the bottom of the page mm -hmm. and Dominion's lawsuit against Fox where they're going to be held liable. And that's absolutely, it's like that New York Times hypothetical that we were just talking about. And, and like the, what, if Twitter were a news organization, that's, that's what, it would have been the same case um, right. with, with the accusations made against you. So